Welcome to Federal Travel and Ethics. In today's presentation, we'll examine the Federal Travel Regulation, or FTR, with a focus on less common travel situations and ethics issues that can arise during official travel. Recordings of these presentations and the live Q&A will be available on demand on the SmartPay Virtual Training Forum. You can also download these slides, which contain additional information in the speaker's notes. Please note that the FTR regulates reimbursement of official travel expenses for executive branch civilian employees. If you have questions about travel expenses for other individuals, such as uniformed service members, you may have to consult other sources, such as the joint travel regulations. As a bit of background about myself, my name is Jeremiah Strack, and I'm an attorney at GSA's Office of the General Counsel. Since 2009, I've been advising the GSA Office of Government-Wide Policy, which writes the FTR, and GSA's Office of Administrative Services, which administers travel policy within GSA. This presentation is based in large part on the questions I and my colleagues at GSA have gotten about official travel. However, there are always new questions, and I'm looking forward to helping with those today. The Federal Travel Regulation, or FTR, addresses a huge variety of topics, from reserving a flight and booking a hotel room for conferences, to stabling a horse and sleeping in an RV out in the mountains. However, all of those rules were written with three principles in mind. First, agencies need flexibility to accomplish their mission. The US government probably has the most diverse travel portfolio in the world. So the FTR has to accommodate essentially any possible travel need. Second, that flexibility must be used ethically. When the government spends taxpayer money on something out of the ordinary, there has to be a rationale and proper approval for it. In some cases, that also includes opening those decisions for public scrutiny. Third, rules in the FTR are written to apply universally with very few exceptions. In an agency bound by the FTR, everyone from the agency head to a new hire are following the same travel rules. Today, we're gonna to spend most of our time talking about transportation. The FTR permits the most flexibility when it comes to transportation. So that's also where the most ethics questions arise. We'll look at these by dividing them into routing, mode, and class questions. Then we'll go through some examples of those questions in practice. Finally, we'll talk about denied boarding compensation for overbooked flights. After going through transportation, we'll also talk about a few non-transportation topics, including lodging, travelers with special needs, using the smart paid travel charge card, and promotional benefits. Finally, we'll cover non-federal source travel. Let's get started with transportation which means physically moving a government traveler from point A to point B. The vast majority of questions that come up with transportation fall into one of three categories, route, mode, or class of transportation. Route questions include issues like where and when employees start and end their travel and detours from that authorized route. Mode questions cover what kind of vehicle the employee takes on each leg of their trip. That is, are they taking a plane? a government vehicle, a taxi, or something else. Class questions all address one core issue. When will the government reimburse an employee for traveling by a premium class? The FTR defines usually traveled route as the most direct route between the employee's official station or an invitational traveler's home and the temporary duty location as defined by maps or consistent with established schedule services of contract or common carriers. This can be an issue for employees who are directed to perform travel while they're away from their official station. For example, I'm a full-time work from home employee. So under GSA's internal travel policy, my official station is a 50 mile radius around my home in Maryland. However, suppose I needed to take care of family in North Carolina and my supervisor approved me to telework from there. If I got travel orders while I was in North Carolina, my orders are still based on me leaving from Maryland since that's my official station. 
That said, my agency can authorize a different route as officially necessary, including a route that starts where I physically am. However, it needs to be done in accordance with agency travel policy. Official travel must be by the usually traveled route unless the agency authorizes a different route as officially necessary. For example, if there's a storm on the direct route, the agency can authorize a detour that takes the employee around the storm. For any trip is within the agency's sound judgment. If an employee, for a personal convenience, travels by an indirect route or interrupts travel by a direct route, their reimbursement is limited to the cost of travel by the authorized route on an uninterrupted basis. If you've ever heard the term constructive cost, this is where that comes from. This is probably the most complicated rule to work with in the FDR, so we're going to go through some examples in a few slides. Next, we'll move on to questions about the mode of transportation. The FTR sets out an order of precedence for choosing among the different modes, since certain modes of transportation are inherently more advantageous to the government than others. First is common carrier, which includes airlines and trains, followed by government automobile, and then rental car. A personally owned vehicle can be authorized only after the agency has considered those, those first three modes. The FTR also uses the term special conveyances. This is a catch-all for anything besides one of those four modes. It includes ride-sharing services and those rental scooters on the sidewalk around DC, but it also covers watercraft, helicopters, and like I mentioned before, horses. While some of these special conveyances have special rules attached to them, in general, the FTR won't stop an agency from authorizing a special conveyance when it's necessary to accomplish the mission on official travel. However, be sure to check your agency policy and council for agency-specific restrictions. For example, at GSA, we have a rule limiting the use of taxis and rideshare services between an airport and a hotel when there are cost-effective or free shuttle services. Practically speaking, each leg of travel will have its own mode. A typical trip could involve getting a ride share from an employee's residence to the departure airport, then taking a plane from one airport to the next, and finally a hotel shuttle to take the employee from the arrival airport to their hotel. In addition, the mode actually authorized will depend on the facts. For example, a common carrier is usually most advantageous to the government when it's available, However, if an employee is on a long-term detail, it may be more advantageous for the employee to take a personal vehicle to their duty point so they can get around without paying for a rental car or using a government automobile. When flying on official travel, the City Pairs program is the mandatory source for airfare. For most routes, City Pairs fares are available on pre-negotiated rates on a last seat basis and can be fully refunded if the trip is canceled. One quirk of the City Pairs program is that coach tickets come in two varieties, Dash CA and YCA. The only difference between these two is that Dash CA fares are less expensive than YCA, but there are a limited number of Dash CA fares on each flight. They're still fully refundable and carry all the other advantage of City Pairs. So if Dash CA fares are available, you should use them for official travel. In addition to coach fares, city pairs also includes business class and premium economy fares in certain markets, usually involving long international flights. We'll talk about other than coach class airfare more in depth in a few slides. However, I'm bringing it up now because city pairs is still mandatory when an employee is authorized to fly other than coach class and a city pairs fare for in that class is available. There are several exceptions to the city pairs mandate. When space is not available in time to accomplish the mission. When the flight schedule is not consistent with agency policy. When a non-contract carrier offers a less expensive fare. And when rail is used instead. The most commonly used exception is that a non-contract carrier offered a less expensive fare. Before authorizing this exception, agencies have to keep in mind that these less expensive fares are usually not fully refundable, 
unlike city pairs. This means that if an agency authorizes this exception, but later has to cancel the trip, the agency still has to pay at least part of that airfare. Lastly, city pairs cannot be used for personal travel, including personal legs of a trip combining official travel and personal travel. We'll see how that works in a few slides. When an employee is authorized to use a government automobile, they may use it only for official purposes. On official travel, this includes trips to places necessary for an employee's comfort and sustenance. The FDR lists a few examples like grocery stores, laundromats, and houses of worship, but that's not an exhaustive list. Gyms and parks aren't listed in the FDR, but taking a government automobile there to get some exercise would generally be acceptable while on official travel. However, whenever you're going somewhere in a government automobile, keep in mind that car has a distinctive license plate. If a car with that, that license plate shows up near something like a casino, you can expect a lot of people to notice, and at least a few of them will write their representative in Congress about it. I can assure you this happens because those letters often get forwarded to GSA since we manage government vehicles. Many agencies restrict when non-government passengers can ride in government vehicles. For example, at GSA, we're prohibited from having any non-government passengers in a GSA car unless they're previously authorized or if it's a life-threatening emergency. These policies are in place to reduce GSA's liability if a non-government passenger is injured while riding in a government vehicle. Other agencies are different and, for example, might allow contractors to ride in government vehicles. Be sure to check your agency's policy on non-government passengers before allowing any to ride in a government vehicle. If a non-government automobile is misused, the penalty to the employee driving that vehicle can include suspension or termination from federal employment. An agency can authorize an employee to use a rental car when they need to use a ground vehicle at their temporary duty point. For example, if they're on a long-term detail and using a government automobile isn't advantageous. When an employee is authorized to rent a car, many agencies require using the DITMO car rental agreement, which is usually the default option in your agency's travel system. Even if DITMO isn't mandatory at your agency, the FTR encourages using DITMO's agreement whenever possible for official travel. DITMO has negotiated extremely favorable terms for the government, including allowing other government driver drivers and lowering the age minimum to 18 years. It also makes resolving accidents much easier. I'm aware of one case where the employee did not use DITMO's agreement for official travel and then got in an, an accident during their TDY. It took two years to get everything settled. Even if you're not required to use the DITMO car rental agreement, and many tra government travelers are, you should consider using it anytime you're authorized to rent a car on official travel. When renting a car for official travel, the default is the least expensive compact car. There are exceptions if a compact car won't satisfy the mission requirements or the traveler's needs. For example, if a traveler could be granted an exception if they're with a large group or have a lot of government equipment and a compact car doesn't have the seating or trunk space to fit them. Another exception is if the traveler uses a wheelchair and requires a wheelchair accessible vehicle. The FTR prohibits reimbursement for prepaid refueling. This is when a rental car company offers to charge an upfront fee so the driver can return a car without refueling at first. Reimbursement for these charges are prohibited because it's almost always more cost effective to simply refuel the car at a gas station immediately before returning the car rather than paying anything up front. If it's not possible or unsafe to refuel before returning the car, an agency may reimburse the traveler for any refueling premium the rental car company charges after the fact. An agency may reimburse for collision damage waivers, theft insurance, or both when a traveler is outside the contiguous United States and insurance is required by local law. However, personal insurance is always a personal expense. Although a rental car is not a government automobile, 
A traveler will only be reimbursed for using a rental car for official purposes while on official travel. However, like with government automobiles, official purposes can include travel for employee comfort. That is, places like grocery stores, laundromats, houses of worship, and gyms. In January 2023, GSA amended the FTR to specify that constructive cost isn't just comparing different airfares or modes of transportation. Agencies also need to consider all related travel expenses, including but not limited to per diem and ground transportation charges. For example, if an employee is authorized to fly somewhere, the agency would also likely authorize ground transportation charges from the airport to their hotel. If the employee instead drives their personal vehicle, they don't pay that airfare, but they also don't pay those ground transportation charges. However, since driving somewhere generally takes longer than flying, they may incur additional per diem. The agency needs to consider all of these expenses when doing a constructive cost comparison. In other words, it's complicated. Agencies will often have to make assumptions about what the authorized trip would have looked like. Ultimately, just remember that employees are only reimbursed their actual and necessary travel expenses up to the constructive cost of what the agency authorized. On the next couple of slides, we'll go through a few examples of what this looks like. Here an employee was authorized to fly from Washington DC to Cleveland, Ohio and return for official travel. However, for personal reasons, this employee chooses to drive. When they get back, they find their mileage and tolls are a bit more than the constructive cost of airfare. So is their reimbursement limited to the authorized airfare? No, we've got to consider all related travel expenses in the constructive cost analysis. When an employee is authorized to fly, Often they also take a taxi or ride share to and from the airport at their origin and destination. That can be four rides total. Here, I've assumed those rides are $20 each for a total of $80 of related ride share expenses. When we add that to the airfare, we've got a grand total constructive cost of $486. That's actually more than the mileage and tolls. So now are we done? If this is the whole story, then yes, the employee's actual travel costs are less than what was authorized when you consider the airfare and related costs, so the employee has reimbursed their whole mileage and tolls. But what if there's a little more to this story? Here, the employee taking the ca a car required an extra day of travel. For example, maybe they wrapped up their work in Cleveland a little after 6 p.m. the last day. They could have taken an 8 p.m. flight and been back home around 10 p.m. Instead, they drove for six and a half hours, meaning their travel ends a little after midnight the next day. In that scenario, the employee receives an extra day of M&IE per diem because of the drive. The mileage and tolls reimbursement plus the extra per diem is greater than what the government would have paid for city pairs plus ride shares. So the employee is only reimbursed the constructive cost. In this next example, we're looking at a trip from New York City to Los Angeles. The authorized trip is from JFK Airport to LAX, which has a city pairs fare of $140 each way. On the way back, the employee actually takes a detour through Seattle so they can visit with family, which is a personal reason. This is a typical combination of official travel and personal travel. The employee flies from New York City to Los Angeles on city pairs, since that's official travel. However, because the return trip involves a detour for personal convenience, the employee has to take a commercial fare. There's no official necessity for the employee to travel through Seattle so it's considered personal travel, and therefore city pairs isn't available for the return trip. Here, the commercial fare for the return trip is $250, meaning the employee's total costs are $390. The employee's reimbursement is limited to the cost of the trip authorized, in this case, $280.
Keep in mind that constructive cost is a cap, not the final figure in all cases. In this slide, we see the same hypothetical as the last slide, but the employee found a great deal on their return fare. Now the cost of flying through Seattle is $99. Therefore, the employee's total transportation cost is $239. Since their actual cost is less than the authorized cost, they're reimbursed their actual costs. Employees never receive a windfall for indirect or interrupted official travel. We're now going to talk about classes of transportation on board common carriers. In the FDR, there are four classes of transportation addressed. First class, business class, premium economy class, and coach class. When we talk about coach class, we're including any seats that are available through a coach upgrade or coach plus program offered by the carrier. In the past, we used the term premium economy class as a shorthand for first and business class. With the introduction of premium economy class on many airlines, that term led to a lot of confusion. So now we talk about other than coach class travel. The other notable change is that premium class travel reports have become first and business class travel reports. That's deliberate. Premium economy travel is not reported the same way first and business class travel is. Therefore, the reports are strictly about first and business class travel. When taking a common carrier on official travel, coach class is the default. However, agencies may authorize exceptions from using coach class in limited circumstances on a trip-by-trip -trip basis. Yeah. We'll go over those exceptions on the next few slides. One thing I want to emphasize is that agencies have discretion when authorizing almost all of these exceptions, subject to their internal travel policy and any collective bargaining agreement. That means even if the conditions of an exception are met, often the agency doesn't have to actually authorize a higher class of accommodations. I've marked exceptions where agencies have discretion with asterisks on the next few slides. The one time an agency must authorize use of, common, of, coach, of other than coach class when it does not have discretion is for a medical disability or special need. Then the agency has to provide reasonable accommodations, which means authorizing the class provided for in a doctor's recommendation. Authorization for other than coach class must be trip by trip with the exception of authorizations based on a medical disability or a special need. Agencies shouldn't authorize any other kind of open or blanket exception. Many airlines now have a coach class seating upgrade program, often called Coach Plus or Coach Select, which charge higher fares for more desirable seats in a coach class cabin. Agencies should develop their own policies for when they will authorize use of these programs. Travelers should check their agency policy instead of the FTR for questions on these upgrades. One exception that's not addressed in the FTR is that employees generally may upgrade to Coach Class, Coach Plus, or other than Coach Class at their own expense. Practically speaking, this also means buying a commercial fare since the employee wasn't authorized a higher class and then being reimbursed the cost of a city pairs coach fare. However, you should check with your agency policy. Some agencies can restrict when travelers can upgrade their seats at personal expense as a matter of avoiding the appearance of impropriety. We're starting with premium economy, which is the lowest other than coach class addressed in the FTR. Airlines have been adding this class to some of their flights recently, but the FTR was only updated in 2022 to address it. This class is less expensive than business class, so the policy goal is to encourage agencies to authorize premium economy when they otherwise would have authorized business class. Most of these exceptions are self-explanatory, so I'm only going to talk about a few of them in detail. The first exception is when necessary to accommodate a medical disability or special need. As I mentioned on the last slide, this is the one exception that's not a matter of agency discretion. Agencies are required to accommodate employees with medical disabilities or special needs, including when they perform official travel. Therefore, if an employee documents that they need to be seated in premium economy, 
the agency must authorize this exception. Everything else is a matter of agency discretion, subject to internal travel policy and collective bargaining agreements. With COVID-19 still being an issue, we've gotten some questions about using the third exception, inadequate sanitation in co coach class on foreign carriers. That exception has only been used when livestock are transported in coach class. So this isn't an exception to apply to travel during COVID-19. It's to keep you from sitting next to chickens and cattle. The rest of us have to stick with masks. The sixth exception is when a flight has an origin or destination outside the contiguous United States and the total flight time is greater than eight hours. Let's put a pin in that for a moment. I want to mention that under number nine, required for agency mission, is designed to let agencies make their own exceptions. It's not for travelers to make their own exceptions. For example, at GSA, our internal travel policy explicitly says there are no other exceptions. Going back to number six, this is an important difference from using business class. To see why, let's first look at the business class exceptions. which are here. These are the same exceptions as for premium economy, except for number six, the 14 hour rule. Let's look at how this differs from premium economy's eight hour exception. The premium economy eight hour exception is relatively simple. First, the origin, destination, or both are outside by the contiguous United States. Second, the total flight time from wheels up at the origin to wheels down at the destination is more than eight hours. That time includes layovers and change of planes. For example, if a trip has a three hour flight, a two hour layover, and a final four hour flight, that's nine hours total. So overall, this is a pretty simple exception. By contrast, the 14 hour rule is a bit more complex. Like premium economy, it only applies when the origin, destination, or both points are outside the contiguous United States. Second, the total flight time must exceed 14 hours. That still includes layovers and change of planes. Third, the employee must be required to report to duty the day after arrival or sooner. Finally, no rest stops can be authorized en route or on arrival. The idea of this exception is that the employee who uses it are expected to walk off the plane and start working. You're not going to be very effective after 14 hours in a coach seat, so agencies can allow you to travel in a more comfortable business class seat. However, the agency can instead authorize premium economy or a rest stop to give you a chance to recover after a long flight. Compared to premium economy and business class, there's only a few first class exceptions, which are here. The one unique exception is when no other seats are reasonably available within 24 hours of departure or arrival time. The other three are the same as they are for premium economy and business class. This chart summarizes the available exceptions for an agency to authorize the use of first business or premium economy and coach class airline accommodations. This also points to where agencies have discretion and where agencies need to develop their internal policy. On an overbooked flight, airlines are required by FAA regulations to follow a certain process to reduce the number of passengers. First, the airline must request volunteers to take a different flight and may offer those volunteers compensation of the airline's choice. This phase is when you'll hear someone on the PA system offer frequent flyer miles or vouchers good for future airfare. If a federal employee on official travel volunteers during this time, they may retain that compensation for personal use. However, they are responsible for any extra expenses, such as paying for their own lodging if they have to stay an extra night. After the volunteer phase, if a flight is still overbooked, the airline can then select passengers and deny them boarding. The airline must compensate people involuntarily bumped from a flight with a payment by check for two or four times the ticket price, depending on the circumstance. 
If a federal employee on official travel is involuntarily bumped from their flight, that payment is a form of liquidated damages for the breach of contract. It must go to the government as a check payable to the treasurer of the United States. This is a photograph of an actual involuntary denied boarding compensation check. Note that the top left area, which reads denied boarding, is filled out. As required by FAA's regulations, the total payment was equal to four times the ticket price. If you get something like this on official travel, then the government keeps it and the check should be made payable to the treasurer of the United States. Note these rules apply only to flights that are overbooked. That is, when the airline sells more tickets than there are seats on the plane, and not enough people miss the flight. When a flight is canceled or delayed for any other reasons, airlines will sometimes offer affected employee passengers frequent flyer miles or vouchers as a goodwill gesture. Those are above and beyond what the airline is required to do, so they're considered promotional benefits. The employee can retain those miles or vouchers for personal use. We've now finished with transportation. From here, we're gonna to touch on lodging expenses, accommodations for travelers with special needs, mandatory use of the smart pay travel card, and using promotional benefits like frequent flyer miles. When reserving for lo lodging for official travel, the FTR states that first consideration should be given to the federal rooms. This is a GSA run contractor administered program which negotiates below per diem rates in fire safe properties. However, there's no government wide requirement to use fed rooms in the FTR. Some agencies do have mandatory lodging programs though, so be sure to check your agency policy. Lodging taxes are reimbursed as miscellaneous expenses, which means they're reimbursed in addition to per diem. In some states, government employees on official travel are exempt from lodging taxes. SmartPay keeps a website with about tax exempt states, including links to forms when those are required. A lot of properties now charge non-optional fees, such as resort fees and urban destination fees on top of their lodging charges and taxes. These are also reimbursable as miscellaneous expenses, even if the total cost of your lodging and these fees is greater than the per diem rate. They work like hotel taxes that way. However, keep in mind that one of the benefits of fed rooms is none of these fees get charged. Peer-to-peer -peer lodging, which includes services like Airbnb and Verbo, is considered non-conventional lodging under the FTR. That means it can be authorized when conventional lodging is in short supply. This includes when conventional lodging is not available, like if the employee is traveling to a remote location. Keep in mind that peer-to-peer -peer lodging services are currently not in federal ETS or TMC systems, but you're still required to use those systems unless your agency grants an exception. That means when you're authorized to book peer-to-peer -peer lodging, your agency also needs to authorize an exception from using ETS or TMC. Reimbursement for lodging expenses can be complicated with peer-to-peer -peer lodging. Unlike conventional hotels, peer-to-peer -peer lodging services charge a daily rate, a separate lump sum cleaning fee, and a service fee. That means it's not always obvious if a peer-to-peer -peer lodging option is at or below the per diem rate. To calculate that, take the cleaning fee, divide it by the total number of days the traveler occupied the accommodations and was entitled to per diem, and then add that to the daily rate. That total rate is more comparable, comparable to a hotel's daily rate, since the hotel daily rate also includes cleaning. If that total rate is at or below per diem, the employee is reimbursed the total. If the total is above the per diem, the employee is reimbursed the per diem rate unless the agency authorizes actual expenses. Reimbursing the service fee depends on whether the use of peer-to-peer -peer lodging was authorized by the agency. Since agencies already pay a fee for vouchers and reservations through ETS, 
The separate peer-to-peer -peer lodging service fee is considered extra. Therefore, it's reimbursed only if the agency approve the use of peer-to-peer -peer lodging. We've already discussed how agencies can accommodate travelers with special needs by authorizing them to fly in coach upgrade, premium economy, business, or first class. The FTR also addresses services for travelers with special needs like specialized transportation, travel by an attendant, extra baggage fees, and wheelchair rentals or transportation. One category I want to call attention to is travelers who are nursing. Federal agencies may recognize that an employee who is nursing has a special need. Agencies may determine that the special need means that a spouse, nanny, or other attendant can accompany the employee on the trip at government expense to provide child care. If no attendant is necessary, an employee can, may still need to use services to safely store and ship milk to a child who remains home while the employee is on travel. For full details, please check FTR Bulletin 22-03. When performing official travel, government employees are required to use a SmartPay travel charge card for all expenses directly related to official travel. Unless using the card is impractical, imposes unreasonable costs, or the employee is exempt from use. This mandate comes from a statute. But using the card also helps the government collect spending data for developing policy and monitor how travel dollars are spent. The government also gets a rebate for charges on the card. There are three exemptions from using the card in the FTR. First, if the employee has a pending application, meaning they don't have a card to use yet. Second, there is an exception if using the card would adversely affect the mission or the employee's safety. An example would be an undercover law enforcement agent. Finally, there is an exemption if an employee is not eligible to use the card. Agencies can also establish their own exemptions, so be sure to check your agency policy on using the card. When the FTR requires that the travel card must be used for expenses directly related to official travel, such as paying for lodging and meals, Agencies may establish policies on using the card in other circumstances. For example, at GSA, we permit our employees on official travel to charge the expense of alcoholic drinks as part of a meal on a travel card. That is, they don't have to split the bill between food and alcoholic drinks. Drinks aren't an official travel expense, so our employees have to pay for them out of their per diem or their personal funds. However, they may charge that expense to their SmartPay travel charge card as a matter of convenience. Many airlines, hotels, car rental companies, and restaurants now offer promotional benefits for repeat customers. These are programs like frequent flyer miles, loyalty points, and app perks. An employee who earns these kinds of promotional benefits on official travel may retain them for personal use if they were offered to the general public and come at no additional cost to the government. The one exception to this rule is that promotional benefits offered for planning or scheduling an official conference may not be retained by the employee. This comes up when an employee books a block of rooms from a hotel and the hotel offers loyalty points to that employee. That employee is not performing official travel when those loyalty points are offered. The employee might not even be going to the conference they're planning. Therefore, it's usually better for the conference planner to refuse the points and instead negotiate for some benefit the conference attendees can use, like an extra conference room or a reduced rate on hotel rooms. Non-federal source travel refers to a legal authority which allows agencies to accept payment for an employee's official travel expenses from a non-federal source in certain circumstances. Payments can be in kind, which means that non the non-federal source pays directly for a service and then provides that service to an employee. For example, a non-federal source can pay a hotel directly and put the reservation in the employee's name. 
One thing to keep in mind with non-federal source payments is that they are payments to the agency, not personal gifts to the employee. That's part of the reason that the rules are different for non-federal source travel than for gift acceptance. The FTR was amended to make non-federal source more similar to gift acceptance rules, but there are still some differences. We'll talk about those in a minute. When considering whether this authority applies, the first question is whether the offerer is a non-federal source. This could be complicated if a private entity is acting on behalf of a federal entity. For example, when a federal grantee is organizing a conference. The second question is whether the thing being offered for or provided in kind is an official travel expense. In the FTR, this includes obvious things like airfare, lodging, and meals, but it can also include a registration fee for a conference. That is, if a conference organizer offers to waive their registration fee for an employee to attend that event, that may be a non-federal source payment. However, when a conference organizer waives the registration fee for an employee who is speaking, presenting, or participating in the panel, that isn't a payment on the days the employee is speaking, presenting, or present participating in a panel. The third question is whether the offered payment is in connection with the employee going to a meeting or similar function. This can include things like seminars, conferences, and training forums. The last question is whether the event is away from or outside the employee's official station. The official station is sometimes called the local travel area or community area. Once an employee is performing official business outside of their official station, they're on official travel, and the non-federal source travel authority is available. There are a few categories of events which are excluded from the definition of non-federal source travel, including any travel necessary to carry out statutory or regulatory functions. Those are activities like investigations, inspections, audits, site visits, negotiations, litigation, and anything similar. Non-federal source travel also doesn't include events where a vendor is going to market to government employees, including through promotional training. When an agency authorizes acceptance of non-federal source travel payments, it's also necessarily authorizing official travel. This is more than just a record keeping detail. An employee on official travel is entitled to reimbursement of their actual and necessary travel expenses. That means the agency is on the hook for anything the non-federal source doesn't provide, including anything the non-federal source offered but broke their promise on. This has happened before. The agency is also required to reimburse the employee for any emergency travel if they get sick or injured on official travel. And if the employee dies on travel, the agency has to pay for transporting the body. Therefore, agencies should only accept non-federal source payments for events they pay for the employee to attend anyway. Sometimes the agency will have to. Non-federal source payments for subsistence expenses, meals and lodging, can exceed the regulatory maximums in domestic areas, including Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and US territories. We're still bound by the maximums in foreign areas. The non-federal source also has to offer these subsistence expenses to similarly situated attendees. For example, if the non-federal source is providing suites at a luxury hotel to all speakers, including a government speaker, the agency can accept that offer. But keep in mind my first point. The agency is on the hook for anything the non-federal source doesn't pay for. If the non-federal source breaks its promise and doesn't pay for that luxury suite, the agency has to pick up the tab. That risk could be a good reason to decline the offer. A similar rule exists for other than coach class accommodation on a common carrier. Like with exceeding subsistence expenses, the non-federal source also has to offer that to similarly situated meeting attendees. What's different is that it can be accepted only if the non-federal source pays in full in advance. It's not good enough for the non-federal source to just promise to pay for the transportation. The non-federal source has to hand over tickets before travel. 
One point I cannot emphasize enough is that an employee must never accept cash or personally payable check for a non federal source travel payment. These payments are to the government. So unless you are the treasurer of the United States, you are not allowed to possess that money. If the non-federal source for some reason cannot process a payment to the US government, which is something we've heard before, then the agency can't accept that payment. Under the FTR, authorizations to accept non-federal source travel payments must come before travel with very limited exceptions. These exceptions can be summarized as, it was a surprise. There's two kinds of surprises when it comes to non-federal source travel. First, and most commonly, an agency may have already authorized acceptance of some offered travel expenses. An example would be that a non-federal source offered to provide airfare, lodging, and waived the conference registration fee. The agency accepts that, meaning they only have to reimburse the employee for meals. When the employee gets there though, it turns out that the conference actually provides lunches. Those lunches are also a travel expense paid in kind. In that circumstance, the employee can accept the lunches and then seek approval after the fact. The second surprise is the total surprise. The conference invites an employee and doesn't say anything about reimbursing travel expenses. It turns out when the employee arrives, their room at the hotel is already paid for. That's a bit more unusual, but it has happened before. In either case, the employee can only accept expenses comparable in value to what's offered to or purchased by similarly situated meeting attendees. So if everyone else is bringing their own brown bag lunch, but the government invitee gets surf and turf, that's not gonna fly. However, this rule does consider similarly situated attendees. So if a government employee is a speaker and the conference paid for every speaker's hotel, that's comparable. Next, this doesn't apply to anything the agency has already declined. Agencies sometimes decline part of an offer. They might accept airfare and a waived registration fee, but decline dinner at a high-end restaurant because of the appearance. The employee can't overturn their agency's decision if the non-federal source offers that dinner again. If the employee accepts something that the agency declines after the fact, the non federal source is always going to get reimbursed. If the employee accepts something in good faith and later the agency declines it, then the agency pays for it. However, if the employee didn't act in good faith, if they accept something that was already declined, then it's the employee that pays out of their pocket. This is a serious penalty for serious violation of the travel and ethics rules. We often get questions about discounts or waivers that apply to all government attendees at a, an event. This is a bit tricky, but these are not payments under the non-federal source rules. I can't point you to anything in the FTR that directly says this, but it's a result of how conference registration fees are usually structured. Often there's a variety of discounts for different groups of people. Members of, of, of a professional organization might get a discount. People who buy their tickets early might get an early bird discount. And for some conferences, government employees can get in free. Taking advantage of these category wide, wide discounts is just being cost effective. And it doesn't count as a non federal source travel payment. GSA recently revised the rules on accepting waived registration fees as a non federal source travel payment. These changes brought the FTR's rules a bit closer to rules for widely attended gatherings, but unfortunately, GSA couldn't get them to match up all the way. Let's look at how they're similar. Headline change is that if a non-federal source invites an employee to speak, present, or participate in a panel at an event and waives or discounts the registration fee for that employee, that waiver or discount is not a non-federal source payment on the days the employee participates. The policy goal is that if an employee is invited to give a speech at a conference over lunch, and the conference is just outside the official station boundaries, there's no need to go through all that paperwork. Let them drive out and reimburse them for mileage. No need for a full ethics review.
There are three ways this exception differs from OGE's rules on widely attended gatherings, though. First, the waiver is still a non federal source payment on days the employee isn't actively participating. If an employee is invited to speak on days one and three of a conference, and their registration fee is waived for the whole conference, then it's considered a non federal source payment for day two. Alternatively, the agency can decline that part of the offer, which means the employee speaks on day one, teleworks in their hotel room on day two, and goes speak again on day three. The second is that the exception only applies to employees who actively participate as a speaker, presenter, or panelist. If an employee is attending to support a speaker, they're not actively participating. So their waived registration fee would have to be processed as a payment in kind. Lastly, meals provided at no cost by a non federal source are always considered a payment. If an employee accepts a meal on the day they speak, present, or participate on a panel, that meal itself has to be processed as a non federal source payment. However, it doesn't mean that the waived registration fee is, becomes a payment. Those two can be separated. As I said in the beginning of this presentation, the federal travel rules were written to be flexible, ethical, and universal. We've seen that flexibility in things like an agency's ability to authorize premium, air cla premium class air travel, rental cars, and peer-to-peer -peer lodging, and non-federal source travel. We've also seen ethics in things like city pairs, the travel reports, and the default accommodations for air travel and rental cars, and using the smart pay travel charge card. What we haven't talked about as much is that the rules are universal. That means the rules apply to everyone from the head of an agency to a new hire who just walked through the door. They apply regardless of mission, whether it's routine travel to a conference or urgent travel to a disaster zone. They apply everywhere on earth. and beyond. Even Buzz Aldrin went to the moon on the Apollo Leffa mission and still had to get his travel expenses approved. Thank you very much for coming to this presentation or listening to it on demand. After this slide, we'll have a live question and answer period. If you have any questions which we don't get to today, please feel free to reach out to the Office of Government-Wide Policy by emailing travelpolicy at gsa.gov. You can also contact me or Amanda Gramlich at the phone numbers or email addresses above. And now I'll switch over to the live Q&A.